University. And I'm really pleased to welcome all of you and everybody online to our book talk today featuring Dr. Wendy Perlman. And she is the author of this new book, which is outside if you'd like to purchase The Home I Work to Make Voices from the New Syrian Diaspora. So I'll do a brief intro. Um, Dr. Perlman is professor of political science at Northwestern University, where she specializes in Middle, Middle East politics, social movements, and narrative approaches to understanding conflict and displacement. She's the author of six books. The current one we, we, she will present on, uh, another one called Muzun, A Syrian Refugee Speaks Out, written with Muzun uh, Malahan, <laughs> um, which was published by Knopf in 2023. Triadic Coercion, Israel's Targeting of States that Host Non-State state Actors with Boaz Atzili, published by Columbia University Press in 2018. We Crossed a Bridge and It Trembled, Voices from Syria, published by Harper Collins in 2017. Violence, Nonviolence, and the Palestinian National Movement, published by Cambridge in 2011. And Occupied Voices, Stories of Everyday Life from the Second Intifada, published in 2003. And I have this memory of walking into the Stanford University bookstore in about 2003 or four when I was teaching at Stanford before I came here. And I saw your book, Occupied Voices. And I was like, I was like, I have to meet this person. This is so fascinating. And then later I met her. So uh, there she is. And I've multiple times in teaching here because I teach on refugees, I've taught, um, we crossed a bridge and it trembled after you mm -hmm. came and presented it here. Yeah. And it's been, it's such a book that students read and spend a lot of time sitting with because the stories kind of inhabit them. And it's been a really productive book to kind of think about. And I look forward to reading this one as well. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Perlman will begin with a presentation and then I will ask a question or two and then open up the floor for audience participation. You can raise your hand. You won't call on them or you want me to? Um, I can. Okay. And then Coco will have people online and, and we'll ask questions um, using, you can ask your questions there and she will ask. Um, and yeah, the book is out for sale outside. And if you are online, Coco will put the link to purchase it in the Zoom chat. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Perlman. Thank you so much all for being here. I guess I should look at the camera and say thank you for being here too. It's cool to do a, a hybrid a hybrid talk. Um, and thank you for that warm introduction, Michelle. Um, I'd like to begin by asking each of you to take a few seconds to think of your own answer to the question, what is home? What is home to you? Your reaction might be positive or negative or kind of complicated. You might immediately know your answer to the question, what is home? Or you might struggle a bit or you might struggle a lot and perhaps never really answer, uh, get, arrive at one answer, or maybe you'll arrive at several answers. But I'm guessing that for nearly everyone, the question resonates in some way. It means something to you, you get it. And that is because home is a universal human experience. It's a theme across literature, film, music, and everyday speech, because the idea of home and finding home strikes at the core of what it means to exist as a person in the world. Today, I'd like to convince you that those forced to flee as refugees have special wisdom on the meaning of home. The violent dislodging of persons from their established moorings and their hard work to build their lives anew reveal truths about belonging and rootedness that simply can be obscured in more settled circumstances. And thus the stories and reflections of displaced people have a lot to teach everyone and perhaps especially those who have not been displaced about the meaning of home. At least this is what I have come to appreciate in the next slide. If Okay, thank you. Uh, this is what I've come to learn um, in the process of conducting interviews with more than 500 Syrian refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers over five continents over the past 12 years. And I would be happy to talk much more in the Q&A about the process of doing interviews in this decades plus long project of, of finding people and doing open-ended interviews to collect their stories. I began this project of interviewing on the backdrop of the Arab uprisings with the desire to understand the lived experience of Syrians' mass protests against authoritarian rule. 
as it was dangerous to do research inside Syria, or at least I was too afraid to do research inside Syria, I began interviewing Syrians who had fled as refugees. And also because my interest was especially in protest, my research networks became strongest among those who identified with the opposition and remain strongest of those today are the majority of my, my interviewees. In 2017, as was said, I used the interviews that I'd collected to date to write this book, We Crossed a Bridge and It Trembled, Voices from Syria. That book is a curation of interview excerpts that aim to chronicle and explain the Syrian uprising and war. That book concludes with the exodus of millions of refugees, but the Syrian story did not end there. My new book, The Home I Work to Make, is a tapestry of totally new testimonials that begin with stories of fleeing Syria and then follows refugees' journeys around the world as they reflect on losing home, searching for home, finding home, not finding home, believing in home, not believing in home, and ultimately rethinking the meaning of home itself. Today, I'd like to share some of these voices with the aim of sustaining attention to Syria's ongoing plight um, and also exploring what refugees can teach the world about how to find belonging in the world. Um, I will begin with some political context uh, that draws a bit from the previous book. And this is because I think it's essential to ground any discussions about displacement and refugees in an understanding of the context that led to people's forced migration in the first place. So in 1970, after decades of coups and instability, Hafez al-Assad seized power in Syria and established a strong authoritarian regime. Upon his death, his son Bashar inherited the presidency. The stories I've collected over the years emphasize how repression and threat of repression became part of Syrians' everyday lives. How a single ruling political party, an omnipresent security apparatus, a pervasive network of covert informants all combined to police society and encourage society to police itself. For many people, a system built on corruption, co-optation, and fear was deeply degrading, but still parents raised children on the saying, hush, the walls have ears. Generations didn't allow themselves to imagine that things could be different until 2011 when uprisings across the Middle East forced down authoritarian presidents in Tunisia and then Egypt. In Syria, a few tentative demonstrations got off the ground, spread over space, were sustained over time, and became a national revolt, first calling only for reform of the political system and then eventually for the overthrow of the regime. People said that they broke the barrier of fear. I've been able to ask hundreds of Syrians to describe what it felt like to protest for the first time. And the majority has said, it's simply indescribable. I would always say, I'm writing a book. Can you try to put it into words? People would say things like, it was the first time I breathed, the first time I felt like a citizen. One man said, it was better than my wedding day. <laughs> And when my wife heard that, she refused to speak to me for a month. Um, one woman I interviewed described whispering freedom in a demonstration, and she said, this is the first time I have ever heard my own voice. And I told myself that I would never let anyone steal my voice again. The uprising remained overwhelmingly nonviolent for months. The regime responded with various forms of repression, from bullets to missiles to mass arbitrary imprisonment. The opposition took up arms and eventually took over large swaths of the country. The regime carried out sweeping bombardment and siege to try to claw back those areas of the country that had slipped to rebel control. Other state and non-state actors became involved in this complex, multi-dimensional and brutal war. And over the years, the Assad regime gradually reconsolidated its political and territorial control. So this is the context of war that has led to mass displacement. All of these are estimates. This graphic is already out of date, but it gives you some sense of the distribution of Syrian refugees around the world. 
Some 15 million approximately Syrians have been forced to flee their homes. Among them, about 7.2 million are internally displaced. They might be in camps, they might be renting apartments, living with families, but have had to flee their homes. Some 5.5 million are refugees in the Middle East with the largest number in Turkey, uh, followed by Lebanon and Jordan. About one and a half million Syrians have obtained asylum in Europe or are in the process of obtaining asylum or family reunification with those who have, which leaves less than half a million distributed elsewhere, including in, in North America. And it's this mass displacement that has led me to think a lot about the question of home. So why home? Public interest in wars and arguably also public interest in refugee crises is strongest during their outsets or their most horrific peaks. And then interest often wanes. Things drop out of the headlines, people look away, they forget. But as military battles decline, new battles become palpable for survivors, like the need to make sense of it all to extract meaning from loss, to find oneself amidst a shattered world. In other words, to find home. Thinking about home can offer a unique window into these processes of meaning making. I spent several years asking Syrians, what does home mean to you? Just as, as I asked you guys at the outset of this talk. And I asked this question because I thought and came to see that it's a way of asking after so much loss, who have you become? What is it that you need to find peace in the world? The answers that I collected offer a way not only to learn about the displaced and the experience of displacement, but also to learn from the displaced about matters that touch about upon every human life, whether you've left home or not. One thing these stories reveal is that home can be thought of as the converges, convergence of various different elements, such as security, love, place, and fulfillment. These elements confuse for people who are rooted. Cultural geographer Yifu Tuan defines rootedness as being, quote, unreflectively secure and comfortable in a particular locality. For Tuan, to be completely at home means you don't have to think about home that much. You don't ask yourself, am I at home or not? You simply are. Refugees, however, arguably, don't have this luxury about being unreflective about home. In the Syrian case, many people can no longer go back to the towns that they once called home. Their houses and entire neighborhoods might no longer exist or exist in the way they once did. And refugees themselves might find themselves needing to build new lives and livelihoods in places where they before never even dreamed of stepping foot. So many refugees are compelled to think about home and ask themselves, am I at home? Whether they want to or not. And this is part of what makes their perspectives so valuable. Arguably, the uprooted see things about roots that we miss when we are more rooted. And among the things that refugee stories in deep thinking reveal is what these elements are all about, these elements that constitute home, and what happens when they disconnect or perhaps never existed in full. So for example, the human desire for security and for love might go in different directions when people leave a place due to profound danger, but their family and friends remain there. In that case, you can maybe have security or you can have family, but you can't have them both together, um, at least in one, in one geographical place. The longing for an attachment to a native place or a cultural familiarity and for personal fulfillment might disconnect when one yearns from the familiar comforts of one's upbringing or childhood, but in that place, there is a ceiling on personal autonomy and what one can achieve. Under such circumstances, people face difficult choices 
about what elements they need or want most in a home. All of which can bring each element into sharper relief, can help us appreciate their varied meanings and dimensions, shedding new light on home itself as a multidimensional concept. So let's hear some of the reflections and stories that emerge in the home I work to make. It's just a small taste of the book. I will share some voices that are lightly condensed uh, for conciseness, along with some broader thoughts focusing on these four elements constituting home. So I'll begin with security. Colloquially, we often refer to home as a kind of haven or retreat. You can think about yourself. It's a place where you can escape from the pressures, the dangers of the public sphere and feel secure um, uh, in, in something to call home. Of course, there's a feminist critique uh, that tells us that home can also be a place of insecurity, and especially in context of domestic violence. Home might be directly associated with lack of security rather than security. So it, it puts a twist on, on that thought. Um, many Syrians narratives also emphasize the element of security in the search for home, but also help us think about what people need in order to feel secure. It might not be obvious or self-evident. And one thing that comes to the fore in these stories is that one, what one needs to feel secure might be grounded in personal experiences of what made one insecure in the past. What were past threats someone might be seeking to, to counter, to compensate for, to overcome in a search for a new home. So I'll share two, two narratives that give different perspectives on this question of security. The first is um, from a Syrian man I, I was able to interview in Tokyo, Japan, uh, where there are about a thousand Syrian refugees now. Um, for him, security is, is really in the physical sense. The context of his narrative is that he was from a town that came under severe siege and bombardment for, uh, for years until it was finally retaken by regime forces and its allies and, and thousands of people were forced to evacuate on, on foot um, seeking safety. And this is his reference point in thinking about home now from Japan. And he said, during those years under siege, I was always expecting to be killed. I moved houses 27 times. All I owned was a backpack and a laptop. I take them and stay with a friend. After a week or two, I'd call another friend and stay with him. Because I had some IT skills, people would ask me for help with anything related to the internet. In exchange, they'd let me stay or take a shower or have lunch or dinner. Now, I don't feel connected to any house at all, not to a country or a city or any place. You can imagine what home means to me. It means nothing. For me, a good home is a place that doesn't get bombed or shelled. It doesn't matter if it's cold or hot, small or big. Home is any place where you can sleep without waking up to an explosion in the middle of the night wondering if you're wounded or not. Another thought on security comes to us from the suburbs of Toronto, Canada. For this woman, security is really in the political sense, especially the legal sense of rights and protections, not necessarily the physical sense of, of safety from bombing. So she said, to me, the most important thing here is the security. In Canada, we've tasted the sweetness of the law. Law shapes people. In Syria, money can resolve anything. You can take the noose off a man's neck by paying a bribe. There was a guy who shot his wife in front of her mother. You know how long he stayed in prison? Two months, because he paid off the judge. Compare that to here, where you feel that the law is here to protect you. I feel secure in all meanings of the word. Sometimes I say to my husband, God protect Canada from us Syrians and the mentality that we carry with us. So two thoughts on security, which can encourage us to think about still other elements that might, uh, that might intersect with security for other people, depending on who they are and what they've lived and how that shapes what they've looked for. So then to move on from security, 
to love. Colloquially, we've all heard the expression, home is where the heart is. Um, at least I heard it myself growing up in the Midwest where it's written on pillowcases and uh, doormats and all over the place. Um, but beyond the cliche, it encourages us to think about how home might not be where you're from, but wherever those most precious to you reside. If that's the case, how do people make home without the people to whom they are closest? And can finding loves make a home out of a once foreign land? Or can love coexist with the sense of being a stranger? Again, two different perspectives. The first comes to us from Sydney, Australia. And here you hear from a man who thinks, yes, home is where the heart is. It's not any specific place. It's wherever you can be with those you love most. The place doesn't matter at all. So he begins again thinking about the violence that he endured in Syria or that his family endured. He said, I lost my dad, my uncle and my brother. I remember thinking that I needed to stay alive for my mom and little sister. I was internally displaced for a month and a half and then felt like I couldn't stay in Syria any longer. I found a smuggler to take me to Turkey and then found work. I brought my mom and little sister to Turkey. We lived together in a small apartment and developed a unique family union. I played the role of the dad in the family, carrying a lot of responsibility. Even my sister called me dad a couple of times. I told her, don't call me that. You're old enough to know that I'm your brother. Now, Australia is starting to feel like home. The first step was when I got my permanent residency and then I met my wife and we got married. I'll start feeling that it's 100% like home once my mom and sister come or maybe we'll relocate to Turkey or to any other country that will take all of us so we can live together. That's when I would say, okay, this is my real home. So the first voice, yes, home is where the heart is. The second voice says, no. Heart can be in one place, but home still be somewhere else. Love doesn't necessarily make it home. Home is something that makes itself in ways that we can't control or can't will into being. The context is his beginning with some memories about his hometown in Syria and then reflecting upon them. So he says, the people who will always be there for me because we grew up together. My seat in the university library, my high school, my elementary school, the store on the corner where the guy gives me something and I'll pay him tomorrow because he knows who I am. All of these details, this is what it makes it feel like home. They happened because of everything around them because of the community we lived in. These details, you can't create them. They create themselves. They say home is where the heart is. I don't believe that. My heart is with my wife and my kid. My wife is from here, Chicago. My daughter was born here. I love them. They're the best thing that ever happened to me. But does that make it home? It could mean home in the future, but it doesn't now. You can't just decide overnight, I'm going to make it feel like home. Home is the details that you don't think about until you lose them. It will take time for me to feel like I belong to this place. At the moment, I don't feel at home anywhere, but I try to find something that I can relate to. Back home, I went to the river. Here, I go to the lake. Okay, Lake Michigan is not the Euphrates, but it's a body of water. So I run by the lake every day. It means something to me. If we barbecue every day in the summer, we will make memories there too. The next element 
is place or a specific kind of attachment to place. So in the last narrative, the speaker conveys his strong attachment to his hometown. This points to the significance of home as a place. And in everyday language, it's most common to refer to home as something that is geographic and locatable. It might be a house, a neighborhood, a town, a city, a country. You could notice that I began asking you, what is home? But typically people will ask, where is home? So thinking about home invites us to uncover how and why and under what circumstances people come to endow particular places with meaning and significance. It raises a question that other scholars have raised. Are humans naturally grounded in some sort of quote unquote native place such that forced migration leaves them uh, ungrounded and uprooted? And once forced to migrate, can home be recovered? Can people develop attachments to new places or will something always be missing? Again, two different perspectives. This one comes to us from Aran Jordan, where we see a woman who has very strong connections to her native hometown and homeland. And losing those eventually um, leads her to reject and renounce any attachments to anything material at all because of the intensity of that attachment that she can no longer fulfill. So she begins saying, home is like a bottle of perfume. You're inside it unaware. When the war began, the bottle shattered. Suddenly you're walking on broken glass. Home is the sea in which you swim. You don't know exactly what makes it home. The fish, the water, the seaweed. You're submerged and home is all of it. And then someone takes you out and tosses you somewhere else. They say, here's some food, some water, a place to stay. Why aren't you happy? I loved every single flower in my homeland. No matter what you give me here, I'm go not going to be happy. They assume that I'm arrogant. They say, refugees receive assistance. They get better opportunities than we do. And still nothing pleases them. I want to tell them, take everything. All I want is to sit on my balcony in Syria and visit my father's grave on Eid. In my heart, return is an option. In reality, it's not. Even if I returned, my neighbors wouldn't be there. My relatives are scattered in different countries. Some died, some were killed, some were arrested. Only God can reunite us. How attached I used to be to small things. Now I'm not attached to anything. We move from one house to another and there are no feelings involved. I believe that God had me go through this harsh experience so I wouldn't get attached to temporary things, but instead to something more heavenly. My home is no longer on land. My home is my God. I'm no longer rooted in the earth. I'm rooted in the sky. The next voice, again, offers a very different opinion. Uh, this speaker has strong attachments to place, but not to his home in Syria, rather to the new home that he builds in exile. The context is he is a teenager who witnessed his uh, friend killed in a demonstration. Uh, he became increasingly involved in protest. His parents began to get threats. His parents shipped him off in a car to Lebanon uh, on his own. We had a very harsh experience creating his life uh, anew as a young, a very young person. But it was that very harshness and the process of persevering through the challenge that made it meaningful to him as his own home, as a as more adult person. So he began recalling how he left Syria. I woke up and my mom said, there's a car downstairs waiting to take you to Lebanon. On the border, the driver said, we're dropping you off here. It was the first time I'd ever traveled. I didn't know where I was or what I was supposed to do. I kept talking to people and found a house to rent. It was a terrible house. It stank and was always flooding. Moving in was the scariest thing in my life. 
I'd never lived alone before. It was the first time that I had to think about what to eat, about finding water to drink or shower. I didn't know how to cook anything. When I finally got a plate, knife, spoon, and fork, when I was able to fry an egg, the house transformed from a source of fear to a source of safety. It became the home I worked to make. I arrived in that house a boy, and that is where I started to gain a sense of responsibility. When I entered that house, it was a country, and I was its president. It was me, my true personality, not something I was creating to please others. I'd write on sticky notes and stick them on the wall. I'd write, today this happened to me, and I'd write the date and time. I felt that anyone living in a house without paper and pencil would disappear. I thought that if someone entered the house, he'd know my life and my thoughts. One day someone would be able to say, there was a person named Mejdi, and this is what he believed. So the fourth element I've discussed, I'll discuss, which is not to say it's the, the final and last word. There are likely still other elements that constitute home, but these are, are the ones that come out most prominently in, in the stories I've gathered, is a sense of fulfillment. So anthropologist Hassan Hajj writes that in contrast to those who visualize home as a shelter, we can instead think of home as a mother's lap where we temporarily rest before springing into action again. And it's that springing into action to discover the world that makes the lap important as a home. Or as theorist Bell Hooks says, home is where we make lives that we feel are worth living. In these views, home is not a particular place as much as wherever or whatever allows one to be one's truest self and realize one sense of purpose. So let me share two different perspectives on this idea. The first comes to us from Istanbul, Turkey. This is a young woman who flees Syria to Egypt and Egypt eventually to Turkey. And along the way, she develops her own theory of home that it's not connected to any particular place, but rather whatever allows you to grow and develop. The context for her narrative is that she works for a Syrian-run organization that's based in, in Turkey, but does work in the internally displaced people's camps in rebel-controlled northwest Syria and Idlib province. And when she first got a chance to travel with that organization to northwest Syria, she thought to herself, I'm going to Syria again. I'm going home. But what she discovered surprised her about her own sense of connection there. So she begins describing these IDP camps. On the outside, she said, the tents are all the same, but from the inside, you see each person's personality. Older people don't put effort into making their tents look like a home because they don't believe they should be living there in the first place. They keep saying, I'm just waiting for the day we return home. But there is a new generation that grew up in this place. They've never spent time inside four walls and a ceiling. They don't know their family's former home. It's all distant now. One time I was with three young women. I was like the prize of the day. They were so excited to see, for me to see their tents. I want to show you my tent. No, I want to show you my tent. I went inside. One was getting married the following week and she'd drawn her and her fiance's initials on the wall of a tent with buttons and beads. She said, I gave it my own touch so it wouldn't be ordinary. I made it feel like home and now it's ours. She continues, our organization does activities to make the kids feel happy. Once we started playing some songs so they would dance and have fun. When we were starting to pack up, this little girl ran and jumped up on the speaker, holding it with her hands and feet. She said, please don't take it away. We don't have any other sounds here. She'd heard something new and her mind started to work. Their children and their minds are craving development. 
but in such an environment, they can't develop. This strengthened my theory of home. Home is about growing into a bigger person. Home is finding what a place can give you that can help you grow. When people feel that they have no more opportunities to grow, they want to go back to what they grew with in the past. That's why a lot of the older people say, I miss my home, I miss my things. They don't have a new goal or a future me they want to become. So they remain attached to their old homes. The first time I went to Syria, I thought, okay, I'm home now. I should feel at home. But I asked myself if I could stay and I couldn't. In that harsh environment, only the brave ones succeed to grow. They have dreams and will do whatever they can to keep making themselves grow bigger. And the last voice resonates with the previous one, showing that this process of losing home and finding home and the fulfillment of home elsewhere can be a process of personal discovery and growth. So much that one might find the very essence of home, not out in the world, but in their very selves. So she again begins comparing her experiences in Syria to what she has now in Denmark and said, when I was growing up, everything made sense. I had Syria, I had home, my religion, my family, the way I dressed, it all fit together. And then suddenly I was outside my home in Turkey. The secular environment questioned my beliefs, my role in life, my sense of belonging. It questioned all of my identities at the same time. It was scary. If you're not that person, then who are you? I slowly started to build my own identity. My ideas changed. I kept reading, searching, and working on how I perceive myself and the world around me. I moved to Denmark. At first, I always felt unsettled. My idea of home was wherever my mom was. Now I realize that home has become my own company. It's myself. Home is literally me, my own body. Wherever I go, I can manage to make it feel like home. I imagine my life as a puzzle. During my life in Syria, I had the corner pieces. The frame was stable, but missing a lot. Moving to Turkey, I filled in some pieces. Being in Denmark, I found the main part. The puzzle will always be missing something. Sometimes you put in a piece and realize it's in the wrong place. But in the end, the journey makes sense. So to end with some concluding thoughts, what can we learn from these stories? Why do they matter? Uh, a, few, a few thoughts about home. First, home is complex. One of the most widespread refrains in anti-refugee and anti-migrant rhetoric is that migrants and refugees should simply go home. And even many, Syrians have told me that even many uh, well-meaning um, and empathetic locals ask questions such as, do you want to go back home? And that's one of the most persistent questions that they hear. All of this assumes that the country of origin is a simple home. And the question is either returning to that home or moving on beyond it. But not everyone necessarily sees the country left behind as a simple and straightforward home. Looking back to Syria, many of the Syrians I interviewed articulate cherished memories of childhood innocence, familial wholeness, cultural familiarity, and communities where no one was a stranger. But they also often express unblinking realism about injustice, violence, and the ways that homeland, that homeland did not fulfill the promise of home. These prior experiences are frames of reference that displaced peoples carry into future homemaking whether what they seek is a replacement for what they lost 
or perhaps a forging of what they never had in the first place. Second, home is political. Systems of rights and protections and participation and economic opportunity shape whether people can attain security, dignity, and the chance to be whomever they want to be. This applies to refugees countries of settlement, many of which deny those basic rights, protections, and opportunities, but it also applies to their countries of origins. For the millions of Syrians who found their voice in the 2011 uprising, displacement deprived them not only of the physical homeland of Syria as a country, but arguably also the dream of creating a new homeland grounded in freedom. For these children of the revolution, forced migration is not necessarily the beginning of exile. It can be instead another stage in an arduous search for belonging and fulfillment. And finally, home, for those who do not have the privilege of taking it for granted, is both a struggle and an achievement. Before creating a home in the world, people must define it for themselves. Discovering what home means, means discovering who one is and how one finds peace. It entails realizing what matters most and what one ultimately can do without if forced. This is a kind of awareness that does not come without adversity, soul searching, sometimes pain. Home, in other words, takes work. And when people arrive at something that they feel is home, it is the home that they worked to make. This understanding exposes the hollowness of discourses that portray refugees as powerless victims or accuse them of exploiting tax-funded services in host states. No less it lays bare the problem of tokenizing the successes of migrant doctors, entrepreneurs, star pupils who defy the odds to earn great accolades. Instead, it suggests that simply developing a feeling of home is itself a feat that defies the odds. Seeing home in this light encourages us to appreciate all the work that refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers do to create rootedness and belonging, to have empathy for those who are still searching for home, and to learn from what they have to say. Thank you. Um, I want to open it up to the audience, but I can kick off a question. But oh, people have questions, so I'll just stay 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 in line. And others, oh, okay. others can ask. Great. Yeah. Did you, uh, like, uh, when you were interviewing, uh, let's say, folks who were younger during the revolution, uh, where they're still kind of, they haven't passed the stage of fully um, rooting themselves in home, did you find that some of them had uh, an idea that home was nomadic because that in their, in their development stage that there was a process of being a nomad or having to go and leave and go from whether it was Turkey to other places? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So one is I probably didn't in interview as many younger people as I wish I could, and that is, in, you know, in some ways limits by IRB protocols of 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 not interviewing children. Um, but even those who are, so so most most people were at least sort of in their in their twenties, um, and 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 later twenties. But I think that your instinct is is totally right. That home means something very different. Um, if if you're growing up years without going from place to place. Um, or um, if it wasn't even either from going place to place or always having the awareness that you could be or having long stretches of time in which you were a guest at relatives or someplace that did, that wasn't that wasn't stable. Um, and then I think it would be interesting one, if those people have arrived at somewhere more stable or not. So it could be that that those childhood years were nomadic, but if they made it to France and got asylum, then that probably makes makes France all the more important and rooted and because the prior period was so so unstable so um yeah i think that's 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 precisely what i would would would, would guess to be the the case 
Yeah. During your interview process, what question provokes the most emotion from the refugees? Oh, thank you. So, um, so th this project has gone through many evolutions over over the years. And when I first began in 2012, I was especially interested in participation in protest. So I would ask questions about uh, about how people came to participate in protest. And the question I always used during that stage of the project was. Um, asking people, there's an expression, breaking the barrier of fear, or we broke through the barrier of fear, which was a, an expression that was quite you know, ubiquitous across Arab Spring countries in 2011. And I would ask people, what does that expression mean to you? And if it happened in your own life, can you tell me how about how and when it happened? And for people who had participated in protests, that was a pretty emotional question. It was, it just sort of opened, um, a door to uh, both to what the what the revolution meant to people, as well as their own personal experience of participating in dissent, and both how and why that was so meaningful. So that was the first phase of the project. Um, over the years, I made the interviews uh, more open ended. I discovered that once you got people talking, they had so many interesting things to say, and I didn't want to limit it only to to 2011. And as the years went by it was no longer appropriate, I think, to limit it to that to that particular moment that I was so eager to ask about in 2012. So now I basically say that I only always ask just two questions. One is, do I have your permission to record? And two is, tell me about yourself. That's literally, that, that's it as far as, as planned questions. And then people just start talking. And my job is basically to be an active listener. And along the way, maybe ask some follow-up questions like, well, what did that feel like? What do you mean by that? Can you tell me more about that to get to kind of encourage people to elaborate on, on some things that, that strike me as really, really interesting and meaningful? But essentially, I'm just open the door and I always think of it as as the interviewee is kind of driving the bus and going wherever they want to go in their life story, which also gives them the chance to not go into certain dark alleys if that's they don't wanna go. Of course, when someone starts talking, they could still talk about all sorts of things, including things that, that are quite emotional and later they re, they regret even talking about, but it in some way kind of shifts the, the agency to the person talking and, and I get to listen to whatever it is they want to say. And um, if there's anything they don't wanna say, it just never even um, comes up. So in the last phase of interviews, that's sort of what I would do. But as I became more and more uh, certain that I wanted to focus on the question of home, at the very end of the interview, I would ask about that more specifically. In, in setting up the interview, a person would know I would tell them I I'm, I'm, I'm wanted to collect Syrian stories of, of home. But, but I wouldn't get to that question to the very end of the interview. And I found that productive in a, in a few ways, that it was after maybe a couple of hours of someone really reflecting on their life, they were in a more reflective space to take on a kind of big momentous question like that. If, it, if I started with that, I would probably get one word answers. Home is where my toothbrush is. Home is, you know, Washington DC or something. But after someone has spent a lot of time really thinking about who they are, it's a way of concluding the interview almost. Is there anything more you wanted to add about that? And here, because it's CCAS, you guys are probably wondering, what word did you use in Arabic to even talk about home? Um, and uh, and I ended up using lots of different different words when I did interviews in Arabic. Well, um, I would say you know, there's home, you know, focusing on this English word home, but it's a kind of combination of lots of different things. And in some ways, uh, you know, uses Watan, which we could think of as homeland or nation, which which is also, I mean, the kind of heaviness of a nation state and, and a homeland, um, which people can also use, you know, poetically and metaphorically, like you are my Watan and that sort of thing, but, but sometimes carries the kind of heavy political connotations of nationalism and, and is something that is used by political regimes a lot, you know, uh, as well. So that was one aspect, some, but some people that word really resonated and that's what sort of got them going. Um, I would also sort of invoke more kind of domestic intimate words that are probably closer to house like bay or menzel or dar. Um, and the word that usually kind of opened up the biggest sort of space for thinking was really intimate or belonging. Um, which can sometimes be really ab an abstract thing to talk about. Um, but when you combine it with those types of, of, of those sort of the combination of those three words, most of the interviewees would, would know what it was I was trying to get at. Um, because most people I was talking to, they've been thinking about themselves, this all this stuff themselves, um, and talking about it with their friends. And 
in focusing on home, I would say it wasn't like I was, I felt like I was kind of entering a conversation that people were already having. Um, and uh, so it didn't take take much for these interviews sometimes to be quite, quite emotional, but um, my questions themselves were usually extremely mundane. <laughs> You sure? Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for sure. this talk. It sounds very interesting. Um, I have a question on how you like basically take all of the interviews and then kind of make it into a research or make it turn it into a book. Yeah. Um, and my question is more because you yeah. did over 200 interviews. Yeah. And because of the interviews, like you mentioned, you were very broad in nature so everyone was talking about their experience totally. how do you turn that into a book that you know is not overshadowed with like theory and research and really centers the experience of the refugees at the same time also is grounded in like some kind of argument that you're trying to put forward or like you mentioned yeah. like um exploring the definition of home for example so yeah. Thank you. I, I love this question. And this is where this is for me, this is the fun part. This is the creative part. And this is, oops, Some of our mm -hmm. students are writing thesis. OK. Oh, sorry. And so, yeah. no, no. They're so they're like, oh, so they're, they're, this is totally. a very pertinent question. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I wish <laughs> I, thank you. And I, oh, totally. And I wish I, I wish I had coined like here are the five things you should you should do. Um, so no, it's a fantastic question. And it's that's the creative fun part and the intellectual part, because we, when you, when you do field work and interviews, people's stories are absolutely amazing, but you're like, what's where's my role in this? Is there any value added for me in my mind to take from this and and hopefully um, add something to the process? And that's also a really, really hard part. So um, I could say we've gone through various different processes. Um, one is of course the slow process of getting things transcribed so that you're working with them on, on um, uh, on, you know, with print. Um, so for the first book, I use a software Scrivener. Do you use Scrivener at all? Um, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a software that is used by, by, by playwrights and, and, and novelists that just allowed me, it's kind of like a digital, you know, million like file folders. Um, and I uh, was at, I had a place where I kept the full transcripts, but then I was reading with sort of categorize um, in different like file folders uh, for me going chronologically because that's how my own mind worked. So it began with the first book sort of stories of the lived experience of the Hafez al-Assad regime and then Bashar al-Assad's first 10 years and then the start of the uprising and then the experience of repression and the militarization of the uprising and then full on war and then, um, and then displacement. And then within that, as themes emerged, just sort of inductively reading them would create new file folders and plop in different excerpts, basically, about. Um, so, for example, when it came to the uprising, I had different file folders for the, the emotions of, of protesting, of social relationships and coming to, to protest, of, of particular towns and things. It was just it was kind of a, you know, it's a digital like color coding of with, with markers that, you know, I did back in the day in elementary school or something. Um, and then I could slowly see the themes crystallize. And that helped me determine if I was gonna do an oral history, a kind of chronology of the Syrian uprising and war, which was the first book. I wanted it to tell the story of the uprising and war and hit all of the major factors and processes and elements that any basic history should, but wanted it to do it with these people's voices. So then for each element, I might've had four or five different, you know, long quotations or passages, and then sort of chose which one was, at, which was most moving or cut and move things around in order to have a diversity of both men and women and people from different places. And, and that sort of thing um, was kind of ultimately if I had four passages talking about breaking the barrier of fear, for example, why I chose one rather than the others. And it was a lot of taking things out, moving things around to stitch together what for me in the end was a curation of testimonials um, in which the argument was sort of in the background. I knew what I wanted people to know if they were to understand Syria, but was able to do it through these, these voices. Um, that was sort of the first book. Uh, the second book was a bit is is a lot more complicated because whereas the first book has a chronology of historic events that have a beginning, middle, and an end, 
thinking about home is a lot more complicated. It doesn't lend itself to any kind of clear structure. And then there's just a lot of experimentation. So my first draft of this was structured in the way that this talk was structured around these different sort of themes about thinking about, about place and love and security. And that didn't work as a book because the themes overlap so much. And at the end, everybody was talking about all of these things. And as a, for a reader, it felt like if you would read one story, you'd sort of go through the whole story and, you know, and then another person, as a reader, didn't feel like you'd be going from one place to another, you'd sort of be going in circles. And that's not very, very satisfying. You want, you want your piece of writing to go from point A to point B and have someone feel like it's going somewhere, there's some progress. So it's worth flipping the page and, and moving on. So ultimately, I, I went back to a chronological sort of format, um, and the book is now structured it, sort of along the passages of a, of a displacement journey, beginning with stories of leaving, and then move, then the next chapter is leaving again, because people often have to have to flee more than one time, um, and sort of finding, searching, transforming as individuals, finding belonging, and then final, and final sort of reflections. So for me, when I had... Uh, that you know concerns about how to structure things in the end i just retreated to chronological things um there's another thing that i started doing along the the way which is qualitatively coding all of the 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 interviews with in vivo do you guys use in vivo or a different a variation a sister a sister thing um a, a sister software of of in vivo um and made a code book that's like eight or nine pages or something. And I like have hired undergraduate assistants to basically read through every single transcript, word for word, line for line and code them according to um, like nine pages worth of themes, which are everything from family to economics, to religion, to like 10 different forms of repression and that sort of thing. The truth is I haven't really used that much for research purposes. I've done it because there's a point where you have so much material that you're going crazy and you can't remember it all. So it's a, a great organizing device. And I know there are all sorts of analytical powers in these softwares, which I'm sure Michelle knows more than I do. Um, but at some point it was just, it creates a searchable database. So if, had, if I wanted to search for economics plus Turkey plus religion, well, it would show me all the passages that, that can uh, correspond to one, you know, one topic or the intersection of topics. For people whose minds work in that way, I think this is an amazing, vast resource. For me, um, I've just kind of known, oh, this is a great story. That's a great person and kind of kept it, <laughs> kept it in my head. It's a bit old fashioned and low tech, um, but but that is also a part of the process. So it doesn't quite an to answer that question of, yeah, oh my gosh, we got this material and what to do with it to say that it's a process. I think of a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, a lot of iteration, um, a lot of, of of writing something up and then discovering it doesn't quite work and trying to rearrange it and do it in a different way. There's no there's no there's no shortcut. But if you're having that frustration, feeling like you can't quite nail it, like it working together, I would just say that's this is a super super common process and probably an obligatory process. And if you just keep working on it, you get to something that hopefully feels like the best thing you can do with the material you've you've collected. That it it realizes some promise in the material while also knowing that there's not one single way to do it. Yeah, because then another, I guess, a question that I could clearly talk forever, but also I'll try to, to, keep it, to keep it a little bit more brief is there's a question when you're doing testimonial based work um, about what, what is your role as a narrator, as a writer. Um, in the first, for the first book, I have an introduction that's in my voice and then the rest just goes name, story, name, story, name, story, name, story. Clearly my fingerprints are all over every single word because I chose what to put and what not to put, where to cut and how to condense and what order to put them in. But someone doesn't actually hear my voice directly after the introduction. In this new book, um, because the topic's a bit more complicated um, or uh, not complicated, abstract, um, I put myself in a bit more. There's an introduction and then I have a chapter introduction for each chapter where I have a little bit on the theme of those stories and then seven or eight stories. And then I come back in my voice with another like mini essay plus um, plus the voices and that's how it works to the end. None of this is probably great formats for a 
thesis, <laughs> but, uh, but, it, but it gives you the hints of the kinds of things you might do later when you have complete and utter freedom and don't have to worry about academic conventions. <laughs> the, the, the time will come <laughs> if you stick with it long, long enough. Yeah. Um, so as African Americans, I think we grew up with a Syrian American community that got started by political, social, or economic uh, uh, patterns in the 60s, 70s, and kind of came to a height in 81 with Hama, yes. uh, the massacre in Hama. And I think that community um, it was, was financially endowed or found themselves to be in positions uh, to build community here in the US uh, that made them leaders of kind of the Arab community broadly. And that's quite separate from post 2011 the American context. Especially since there's like the Syrian diaspora, it goes all the way back to the Ottoman Empire in the Midwest. And so there's, I guess there's like a question in the Western, at least Western European and American context, maybe you know, also Australia, what does Syri Syrian diaspora mean socially and politically? Wow, well, it's, it's, it's such a terrific question. Um, and then, you know, the subtitle for, for this book is sort of Voices from the New Syrian Diaspora, and it precisely to kind of recognize that there's a long history of, 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 of Syrian migration and existing Syrian diaspora. And what is the experience, particular experience of those who experienced 2011 and left in its wake? Um, because it's it's a very, it's a, it's a different set of, of experiences. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. So what does, I guess is the question, so what is this this new yeah, post-2011? It's a lot of differences about the communities integrated. Has there been uh -huh. some classism between them? So. Yeah, but I, I think there, 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 there has been, and that those have kind of intra-diasporic um, tensions and solidarities and relationships are, are, are super, are super, super, super interesting to think about. So there are, um, yeah, on, on the one hand, you have a, sort of the older Syrian diaspora community that is, as exactly as you said, played a leadership role in things like um, building NGOs, charitable organizations, whether it's, I mean, activities, whether they're lobbying Congress or doing amazing medical work um, in Syria or in, in the border countries. So they had the capacity to do tremendous amount of, of, of work and give and give tremendous amount of, of resources. And I, and I imagine all Syrians are, are grateful and appreciative of, of that. Um, but yeah, that could probably lead to some, some, some classism and some tension, uh, some tension too. Perhaps some sense of, of, of patronizing sort of dynamics or, um, you know, we know better or, or that sort of thing. And I, I heard things interestingly among um, Syrians in, 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 in Europe and in Germany, where I've spent oh, quite quite a bit of time, also sense that oh the 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 existing Syrian diaspora um, is like you people are going to mess things up for us. We had a good a good gig going. We've established ourselves. We speak the language, and now you know you new Syrian refugees have come, and German German society is all upset and anti refugee and says refugee and associates Syrian with refugee. Where I'm not Syrian a refugee, I'm a doctor. I've been here for twenty years, um, and so that there's been, you know, some some tension of almost like a feeling of of of, of turf or like a, a zero sum sort of game that we made these gains and if you guys come to sort of inch in on them, it won't it'll take away from something that we've come and, and built and that can be some tension and 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 I, I talked to some post two thousand eleven folks who were coming expecting maybe more solidarity and more giving and were. Uh, upset or disappointed to find that kind of reaction. At the same time, there are people who find, um, you know, tremendous, tremendous, you know, philanthropy and giving and commitment and, and activism as well. So it's, I think it's a process of discovery and sort of self-discovery of maybe people assuming, I could imagine that people could assume, oh, we're all Syrians, but you think, I think, you know, I, I as a Syrian think that being Syrian is something, but you think that Syrian is something else. And then we discover, that maybe being Syrian means different things to us, or we have different references, or um, that those who've been here for a long time have a thinking about Syria, which new folks are like, that's completely outdated. You're stuck in the 1980s. You know, even your language might be stuck in the 1980s, and some of your thinking might be stuck in the 1980s. And and um, uh, and then and then even within the the post 2011 folks, those who left in 2012, as opposed to those who left in in 2019. So um, it's it's such a dynamic 
complex um, society that had where, where so much has happened so quickly that there is probably, there's a lot of diversity of experiences that have to be worked through to thinking about to what degree this is a single community or a, 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 a mosaic community of, of, of people with, with some different ideas and experiences. Did, was it do you want to follow up? I have a follow-up question. I know that people yeah. ask, but if, yeah. if, when can you, when you can get to it? Yeah. Do you compare it to kind of the Lebanese diaspora? Anyway, mm -hmm. also in terms of, in terms of mm -hmm. very early movements, then some things in the 70s and 80s, and then what was, yeah, that's just something. Yeah, yeah per perhaps, I, didn't mean, I mean, it with, with, with some added sort of specificities of most people not being able to go back. Some people do go back, but a lot, a lot of people can't imagine going back. And, um, yeah, and and the circumstances that led that left people to 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 leave. Yeah. 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 This is a question. Oh, great. From uh, one of our students who's oh. written online. Oh, great. Uh, he says, "I truly appreciate your constant efforts to yeah. hear the voices of Syrian refugees through their lived experiences, find valuable meaning in them, and remind people of Syrians and the hearts of those who become indifferent as time goes by." I wonder if you believe these efforts can bring some. I wonder if you believe these efforts can bring some kind of tangible change aside from having their stories heard and changing people's perception. Thank you for your great lecture. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, this is a question all academics we you ask ourselves, right? Like, do, do, does what we do matter? Can it change anything? I don't think I would, you know, um, I don't flatter myself to, to, I don't know, to think about it, if we can bring about concrete change. I hope so. All, I think all we can we can do is try. You know, and, and when you think about each of us, like what are the tools that we have at our disposal? What what are our skills? What is what is it our time and our resources and our training allow us to do? Um, I can collect stories and, and put them together in books. I hope it, it people read them and it and it can change something. Um, but I'm probably not the best person to ask about every, about the impact of my own work. But I but I hope so. I hope so. And I think that one, for example, one theme that comes together, come through in this new book is I would really say the, the power of a, of a single friendship or a single relationship. There's so many people I I, I spoke with, um, that might, especially finding themselves in, in European asylum situations that are quite lonely and um, in society, they feel are quite individualistic and in languages that are foreign and, and bureaucracies that are hard to navigate. But even like a single local friend you can turn to to help you call to get a doctor's appointment that makes you feel the difference between feeling like you know nobody in this village in Bavaria and that you've got someone you can turn to is is really 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 um huge huge so if this is the kind of so if so I think for me the the greatest impact might be if someone were to read that think and be a little bit more open to to treating a newcomer with 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 compassion and reaching out Literally, I think it can change lives. For some of the people I talked to, it changed their lives, a single friend. Um, maybe this is a good follow-up. Yeah. I'm a little curious, um, since you've worked on this for a really long time and with yeah. people in different contexts and places, Yeah. Um, I imagine also returning maybe to interview yeah. the same person mm -hmm. again. What's it been like for you to navigate these relationships across times and spaces? Oh, thank you. Um, it's you know, it's 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 hard. In many ways, it feels like uh, um, I mean, it's wonderful. Like it, it means it's it's enriched my life beyond any degree. I mean, the, the privilege of of knowing these people and, and developing relationships and getting to know their families and that sort of thing is is absolutely um, absolutely incredible. There's also a lot of feeling of a lot of guilt of of never you know of never quite doing enough you're never in touch enough as you as you, as you should be or could be and you know that's it's it, it's it is a kind of feel a lot of feeling of of um oh I should reach out to people more I'm so sorry I've been so out of touch you know a lot of messages that that start with oh I'm so sorry yeah, it's been so long since I contacted you and and that's part of I mean also that i, I if it aired on the side of getting a lot of breath and a, and, and a lot of, of interviews as opposed to really, really in depth with a smaller number of interlocutors, which means I'm, I'm probably never quite as in touch with everybody. I'm sorry as I, as I should be, but, but you try, 
but you, but you try. But it's been amazing to see people over the years. So for example, even the, some of the people that I, whose stories I read are now in a very different place. And it's been amazing to get to see them sometimes in a better place, sometimes in a not, a not better uh, place. Um, one thing is, um, you know, it's a, it's a, the interviews I did over various years and last summer when the, when I was about ready to sort of put the, the book to, to, to go into press, I reached out to the 38 speakers in the, in the book and showed them at that point, the sort of condensed edited narrative as it would appear in the book and asked for their permission again at that time saying, you knowing who you are now and seeing this as a version, you know, do you approve this? Would you want to use your real name? Is there anything you would want to change? And most people said, read that and said, oh my God, I said that. <laughs> but it was amazing. Almost nearly everyone's view had changed in some way. They were like, this is so interesting. I'm, re I'm having a conversation with my younger self. And then yeah. seeing their own reactions to how they had changed um, was reminded me that home is a dynamic process. All I have are snapshots at one moment in time, not someone's unending theory. And in being able to have contact with people over time, made that lesson extremely clear for me in a way I don't think I would have appreciated. Um, in part because we, you know, we do these texts, we code them, we deal with them, we think so much about this on paper. What I have is something on paper. And these are real human beings whose lives have completely moved on. So uh, that's been incredibly enriching and has taught me a lot. Okay. So, I just had a, a comment and it's kind of related to the discussion you were having about the Syrian diaspora, but I was struck by how much this kind of these uh, kind of descriptions of home reminded me of kind of like like immigrant narratives, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously these are different contexts. But then I was also thinking about the class issue that came up, and thinking about you know, and those of you who study migration probably think about this, right? Who are that there are lots of immigrants who are you know technically not forcibly displaced who really can't go back, right? Or going back is really a difficult thing to do for economic reasons, for political reasons, or for other reasons. But I just wanted to say that, and I'm sure you've thought about it, but I was really struck by how the, how these stories kind of resonated with stories of immigrants kind of thinking about home or thinking about never, I'm never going to belong here and the kinds of things you do to create belonging, right, in new spaces. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. No, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. And that's also one of the reasons why I eventually sort of focused on on home is because it's, I think, this a kind of a, a common ground meeting place where people with lots of different experiences can relate in some way. And any any migrant experience, any any experience of being from one place and then living somewhere else, I think would would provide lots of of connections. And and even if you don't have a migrant experience, home hopefully means something to you in some way. So it's uh it's it hopefully is I I hope it's a place that kind of can create empathy and and connection. Yeah. Yeah, in a way that just if I framed it as as refugees or even as exile, some people might think, oh, well, I don't relate to that. That's not my story. That's completely different. Those are those folks. But home is something I my aim was for anybody to be able to say, oh, yeah, I have an experience of home, too. And that'd be the, the entryway. Yeah. So I'll give that the hand in the corner. And then get, yeah. Uh, I want to add to that I am one of those people that has a wall art in a home that says home is where the heart is. <laughs> oh, good for you. <laughs> to kind of extend the flip side of your question too, and then um, uh, in one of our classes this last year, we read a book by Sarah Baltieri that talks about Syrian migration uh -huh. in America, and, and one of the things that struck me that uh, about this like theme of homemaking was that a lot of these Syrian migrants were like pleased with their ability to build a home because of the way that they were, because of the way like the local, local political environment permitted them to yeah. integrate and build a home, whether it was through these Samakra Jalans or in this culture of like Lebanese Syrian identity on TV, like the local political environment permitted it and allowed them to build a home for themselves. So mm -hmm. I guess my question is uh, like, to what extent did the different local political environments in the countries uh, that you were researching from permit Syrian migrants to build uh, a sense of home? Uh, and to what extent did that allow them to desire to build a home or did they did it intimidate them, deflate them? Uh, and then also to what extent does your book actually discuss those regional differences? 
Thank you. Um, it does little bits, and that's also one of the reasons why I added these sort of little chapter introductions be between them, because I think that there are a lot of um, of contextual factors that the interviewees bring up that could benefit from a bit more, or not benefit, but like uh, uh, the, the reader could have a bit more context to help put that, to understand the context of that. And yeah, absolutely. And the, and the biggest, sort of the starkest differences um, were, were Syrians who are in countries on Syria's border, it's in, in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon, um, and those who move it to sort of the global north of, of Europe or North America or Australia, and the kind of the stark differences in terms of legal rights to some, have some type of permanent residency, whereas in the countries on Syria's borders are predominantly treated as, as guests, don't have uh, rights to permanent legal residency, the fear that they will have to go back or governments will send them back at any point that they deem Syria to be safe and the war to be over. Um, and because of that, often also lack legal rights to work in the formal economic sector. So people often are working in the informal economic sector with you know, low wages, exploitative conditions, and no recourse if you have a bad boss who decides not to pay you or decides to beat you or whatever. Um, and uh, and then all the material deprivation that comes from that. So that what it means to make home when um, you are, lack the most basic, you know, legal rights of residency, as opposed to people who've made it to Europe often obtain asylum, have a pathway to citizenship. There can, for some people, be still a residual fear. They're going to deport us. They're going to deport us. That is really deeply ingrained. But legally, have have papers, have uh, social welfare states, especially in the European context, that have invested a lot of money into allowing people to have um, learn the language, have job retraining, um, to kind of get the basic tools people need to restart their lives. Um, but at the same time, face still lots of difficulties of navigating these foreign environments and complex bureaucracies and in cultures that are different, learning languages that are different. Um, some people are able to get paperwork um, and do, do job recertification to be able to work again in the profession that they worked so hard in back home and other people find that they really um, can't work again really in that what whatever might have been their professional track or aren't able to start school again, what had been their studies and have to kind of reinvent themselves professionally, um, which can be, for some people I've talked to, kind of opens new doors and allows them to do new things. I don't have to be an engineer or a doctor. I'm gonna study critical theory here in, in Germany or whatever. Um, and for some people, it's a real loss of identity that is, um, depending on what stage of life you're at, that's, that's really, Hard. I thought of myself as a pharmacist. And that was my my pride and how I, my status in my community, and and I won't ever really. I don't see how I can do that again here in in Sweden or in Germany or something. So they're also and all of these are structural parts of the economy, parts of the legal system, parts of the political process um, that 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 really I think shape people's life life chances, and that's apart from sort of racism and Islamophobia and and tensions within society. Um, an anti-refugee sentiment or anti-Syrian sentiment of which um, you can find in every single country. <laughs> you, they have it in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, and they have different varieties of it in, in Germany, Sweden, and the United States, um, but, but, they're, but they're different types of um, uh, challenges that, that people have. So, I mean, given that there's a full array of challenges, of, I mean, if I had to put my bet on, I think, what is the most sort of important, valuable set of context and circumstances and environment that can help people develop that sense of home. And I would, maybe it's because I'm a political scientist, put my money on sort of legal legal rights and, and protections as, as the foundation from which other things can build. And I think there's there's been there's something of a debate about does the cultural familiarity of a, of, of, of a place where people wind up where it's the same language and similar foods and similar landscapes and a similar ethnicity how much does that matter as opposed to systems of of rights and i would i would would bet on the systems of rights of being eventually what is most important so for a lot of the people i talked to who felt more at home in turkey and lebanon for example in early years when i may have interviewed them now all want to leave they all want to leave those those countries and and that sort of an initial kind of cultural familiarity um did not sort of withstand the test of, of cumulative challenges of not having that, 
have having basic rights, which is not to say that it's at all you know easy in Germany either, but um, but but the, that those those legal protections are something I think is critical. Yeah. Um, is there a parallel process going on among the host communities mm -hmm. that they are also when all these new unfamiliar people with unfamiliar ways of living come into their community? Is some of their hostility or racism coming from a place that they too are fearing a loss of home, that home will not look like home anymore with all these new people and new traditions and new cultures coming in? Yes, I, I, I think so. I mean, when you listen to this sort of rhetoric, um, so for example, like there's rhetoric from the AFD party in, in Germany that says things like, well, the Syrians can always go back to Syria, but if we lose Germany, we don't have a home to go back to. And I think there is, you know, whether it's um, you hear this in Turkey to, from Turkey to, to Germany of of uh, our 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 society is being flooded by these foreign people, and we walk down the street and signs are written in Arabic as opposed to this language, and they have a different different culture and different customs, and our home is being taken from us and we're under threat. And that might be some of the kind of anti behind the anti-migrant rhetoric that we're hearing even in the this current election here in the United States. So yeah, I think it's a really very interesting point of that sort of the, the two sides of the of the coin of how um home can be used uh as a as a as a weapon against against the arrival of newcomers. You see any sort of remedy or way to mitigate that? I mean spreading immigrants more thinly or I don't know or trying to get people to empathize with what they experience loss of home, you feel lost at home. So maybe like is there some way to bridge that? That's a great that's a great question. Um, um I don't I mean I don't know like what is the power of here of, of storytelling and empathy and having people meet each other, learn from each other, hear each other's voices. I I I hope that when there's a human connection and it's easy to to demonize refugees and migrants um, when you're not talking to one and knowing who they are, um, and 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 that's I mean even in the in the title of of my book trying to emphasize that that people are doing such tremendous work in order to build something called home. I'm going to steal your home and take your home. It's such a process of, of, of personal labor and sacrifice and struggle that I, I would hope I would hope the more people learn about that, the more empathy they have and see that there's there's space for for newcomers too. But um it's it's a tough, a tough thing to to face. If you could reflect a little bit on the role that gender plays in these narratives, because of course notions of home and home making and constructions of home are deeply gendered. Right. But as our refugee experiences yes. and, and participation in revolutions and the like in relation to mobility and mobility and the like, so how gender comes up in your work. Yeah, thank you. I mean, in, in lots of different ways. And this is something where I, if I go back to my in vivo and I search for gender, I can have more systematic analysis. So what I'll give you now is instead of a bit uh, impressionistic, um, but in lots of ways, I mean, all, all the things from, from young men uh, migrating and finding local uh, locals who are suspicious saying, well, women and ch refugees should be women and children, but you young men aren't the deserving refugee types and them grappling with that feeling like they need to prove their their worthiness and prove uh that they their their, their legitimacy that they had to flee home um as opposed to stay home and fight or do whatever that's one thing um i come across uh often um a gendered way in which sometimes men talking more about status um and their identity grounded in the kind of status that they had back in the home country where they were recognized as the head of a household or the owner of property or a certain profession. And what, part of what made it home was that they, they were, they recognized with the certain status and then leaving that community and being thrown somewhere where nobody knows who you are um, can be a kind of devastating loss of, of home. And I've talked to couples in which the man in the family that's really unsettling and makes it extremely difficult to build home anew Whereas the wife and the family maybe didn't have that experience and can move forward in easier ways. And maybe even 
the unsettling of, of certain things creates new opportunities. Um, uh, that, that's not probably exclusively gendered in, in that way. That's a male female thing, but, but that sometimes can be, um, that also there are certain, you know, spousal or partnership relationships gendered in certain ways, you know, division of, 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 of labor in the household expectations that were meant something in a kind of taken for granted way in, in Syria, for example. And now people are, some are totally different where, um, those are unsettled where maybe those can be recreated, but don't need to be. And for example, th those in, in, in Europe who wound up places where maybe back in Syria, there was the male head of household. So the, the finances of, of the economy of, of the household was the man having the, the purse strings and the woman was dependent. And now they're in Sweden, where Sweden's like, both of you are refugees and receive a receive a social welfare benefit and we don't care man and woman you're both equal in the eyes of the state and both equally get a certain um you know uh, uh a social welfare payment each month which um, totally un, uh unsettles the, the power dynamic and access to resources and that's not the only story but it's it's part of why you have a lot of syrians in europe talking about the high rates of divorce among syrian refugees there and of course i mean you know, i'm sure the that, that what people have experienced can, can, can shake and, and challenge the, the strongest of, of relationships, but um, uh, but it's part of, uh, I think, uh, ways that ge gender roles are also really unsettled. And sometimes come back, you know, like an earthquake, sometimes come back to what they were and sometimes wind up as something very different than they were before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's just about the previous question. Uh, yeah. I work with the, at the Buddha, University of Buddha with uh, folks at the Faculty of Education, and they themselves had a lot of um, programs for uh, Ukrainian migrants that were coming uh, after the invasion. And my work at the university, I was doing a talk on Syrian refugees at the Canadian public, uh, in the public system, uh, education mm -hmm. system. And there was a start. Um, differentiation that they would make between Ukrainians and, and Syrians that were in, in uh, and no, and no, these were like people who genuinely are humanitarians. They love to support. It was, they were educators. They're oh. long time uh, teachers and they do policy and education, but there was a clear distinction in how they saw um, the need for getting the Syrians in Norway as educated and as established and as safe so they can return to rebuild home versus the Ukrainian. It could be the freshness of the Ukrainian uh, refugee, uh, you know, the intake of Ukrainians because they were, I was there in May, 2022. So the Ukrainian, uh, uh, like the, their situation started in February, March. And so um, I I often think that the difference that they were, like the way that they were articulating the difference was race. It was purely race. And and I think within your, your question about what is home, it's the issue isn't the combating like you know spreading them as much yeah germany has 500,000 that's a lot yeah. but it's also the idea that my home needs to be purely one way in race and in look and i think that is a much more uh you know that's a target to change rather than like you know thinking about how we're going what's our migration policy because that's still high, having a hierarchy on the individual and so whether Norway wants to be like, you're both equal in our eyes, it still differentiates in race and how it's treating the Ukrainians versus the Syrians. I'm not saying that the, uh, the government in Norway wasn't good to the Syrians. It was, it was just like, there was a program of ensuring that they are here so they can live, breathe and eat and educate themselves so they can go back one day um, versus the Ukrainians. It was completely different. It was like, we are now, Putting them in housing and in permanent housing, um, where they are, um, you know, we're looking to uh, if the like one of the faculty, uh, the dean of the faculty of education had mentioned that there's a potential of giving citizenship and passports very quickly because you don't know if there's a we were talking about hypotheticals if the Ukrainian government was to collapse, um, and that's not something that I could have. Ha Imagine of hearing him say that about Syrians. Like Syrians, there was a process, and that they need to hear learn the language in a point where um, we're not—they're not changing too much of Norway. Mm -hmm. um, 
And again, that was localized to Buddha and the Arctic Circle. It's a completely different environment than um, the more metropolitan areas. But, yeah. Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds very familiar. And I mean, connecting to this question of local seeing, think, feeling like if these people come, they're going to change our home. Yeah. Nor they will take over Norway, and there will be a Muslim invasion. And I, mean, I remember in my first, uh, I ended up spending five summers in 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 Germany, and I remember the first summers hearing people say things like, you know, all these Syrians are they going to force my sister to wear a hijab and things? I'm like, are you crazy? You know, and you talk to Syrians and they're like, all we want to do is get through the bureaucracy and 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 get our paperwork and you know get a, get a, a get our insurance, wait for the letter to come and that sort of thing. But Syrians were overwhelmed by bureaucracy and simply wanted to be safe and get their kids back in school and think about the future. And the last thing they were, you know, it was laughable that they someone wanted to change German society but of course you know population movements does gradually change society and we hope it it changes societies in ways that are great it's multicultural and dynamic and people learn from each other and the food gets better and you know all these types of things but um but i think there is a lot of local fear of um our country is being taken over it's no longer ours it will change um and uh and that's seems almost an existential sort of threat, which is mixed with a lot of racism, and in this case, also a lot of Islamophobia. So it's it's tough. I think that's a, a real part, and kind of a rise of increasing anti-migrant sentiment and, and, and the right throughout Europe and and in places closer to home as well. Places that are basically all immigrant based. Right? Yes. This is the interesting thing about the U.S., like a country of immigrants, right? Absolutely. And um, and the immigrant threat still has value. I mean, it's just, yeah. you only have to be here a generation to start seeing the next generation as a threat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The <laughs> shut, you know, sort of shut the door behind you. Yeah, yeah it's, it is a, it's a, it's a recurrent story. Yeah. It is time and we should oh, pause. No. Thank you guys. So these are wonderful questions. I really